Hello class, so now let's go ahead and go over chapter eight, supporting your ideas. So a good speech is not composed of just hot air and generalizations. Your audience will want to be more convinced and they will be more convinced when speakers provide credible evidence, strong supporting materials to back up their ideas. The problem with generalizations is that they don't answer these three questions that listeners always ask themselves of the speaker. What do you mean? Why should I believe you? And so what? So let's consider the following statements. Let's say you uh, make the statement as a speaker. Automobile, automobile accidents are a serious problem. That's just a very generalization. So your audience would say, okay, what do you mean? Like be more specific. Why should I believe you that this is a problem? And so what? So you want to support this statement. Whenever you do this, you're going to state that statement, but you're including evidence. So let's see the specific example of what would be a good way of doing this. According to the New York Times, a very credible source, nearly 40,000 people, you're providing that um, evidence, the amount of people, the statistics, died on US roads last year an average of almost 1,000 every nine days. So you're breaking down to something that's easier for your audience to understand what that 40,000 means in a year um, per day or per nine days. The United States has the highest per capita rate of car crash deaths of any nation in the industrialized world. So it's even really um, emphasizing why it's a serious problem because the United States is basically the highest one up there. In comparison to if we had the same death rate as Canada or Australia, uh, we would actually save 16,000 lives a year. So which statement would you find more interesting and convincing um, if you're in the audience and why? Well, the second one, because it is being supported. It's not just a statement being made. So the way that you will be supporting your ideas in your speeches is by weaving different things. You're going to be weaving examples, statistics, and testimony. And then we'll be talking about how you cite your sources orally. So supporting materials. These are materials used to support the ideas in your speeches. And the three major kinds we just stated are examples, statistics, and testimony. Examples are a specific case used to illustrate or represent a group of people, ideas, conditions, experiences, or the like. And research has shown that vivid, concrete examples have a strong impact on listeners' beliefs and actions. So there's brief examples, also called specific instances, and they may be referred to in passing to illustrate a specific point. So let's look at this brief example that illustrates advances in creating artificial limbs for animals, large and small. So this would be a speaker who's presenting on that topic, and now they're gonna provide an example, a brief example to support their idea. Meet Moshe, an Asian elephant who, has seven, who was seven months old when she lost her left foreleg after stepping on a landmine. Thanks to a series of artificial legs provided by Thailand's Foundation for the Asian Elephant, Moshe has been able to regain her mobility, even though she has to support her body weight of 4,400 pounds. So you can see how that would have a stronger impact when you provide that brief example along with what your topic is. It would uh, be able to really sway your listeners a lot better, especially because um, it's providing that specific instance. Here's this specific example. It helps your listeners to really understand um, why it's important. Then we have extended examples. This is more of a story or a, nar narrative, a narrative or an anecdote developed on some, at some length to illustrate a point. So the other one's very brief. The extended examples are more of a story. We also have hypothetical examples. That's an example that describes an imaginary or ficti fictitious situation. So right now, let's look at an example of a hypothetical example. Um, <clears throat> so the speaker would say, Imagine you are at the farmer's market and in front of you are ripe red tomatoes, sweet and juicy and full of flavor. 
To your left are bushels of fresh leafy greens packed with vitamins and minerals. Now imagine you are in the supermarket and in front of you are dull mealy tomatoes that have been treated with pesticides. To your left are wilted heads of iceberg lettuce that have little flavor and even less nutrition. This is the choice we face whenever we go shopping. It is a choice between buying locally grown organic produce and heavily treated factory produce. It is also a choice about our health. According to the British Journal of Nutrition, organic produce has more vitamins and minerals and even fewer pesticides than traditionally grown produce. So you'll see the topic is about how the farm grown organic produce is more healthier choice. And by providing that hypothetical example where you put yourself in that situation, you can imagine, yeah, you know, when I go to the supermarket, that is what the vegetables look like compared to going to a farmer's market. So it helps in supporting what the topic is. So you wanna use your examples to clarify your ideas and they are a very excellent way to clarify unfamiliar or complex ideas. This principle works well in speeches. We'll see an example without and with. So let's say you're doing a speech about what um, suspension bridges are. You could do a, a, a example where you're describing like the actual mechanics um, or engineering of the bridge. The suspension bridge has a roadway suspended by vertical cables attached to two or more main cables. The main cables are hung on two towers and have their ends anchored in concrete or bedrock. See, that's a very complex idea. Not really gonna help the audience to really imagine or put that together in their head. Versus two well-known suspension bridges are the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Now, because everyone has at least seen pictures of one or the other, using these as example really clarifies the meaning a lot more quickly of what a suspension bridge is versus the more abstract idea of that first example. You want to use examples to reinforce your ideas. You can cite figures and statistics from very credible source, sources about your topic, but you also wanna reinforce your idea by including an example. Let's look at this one. Changing lives through the literacy network. You can state the figures from the US Department of Education and the National Research Council that shows that more than 30 million adults in the US lack basic literacy, liter literacy skills. You can't talk. Um, however, you also want to include in there to reinforce this idea by using an example. Here we have the example of Dwayne McNamara. He's a father of two daughters who had struggled with reading and writing for years before turning to the Literacy Network for help. You would wanna discuss how the problems that he faced because of low literacy and how the network helped him acquire the skills he needed to succeed in life and therefore give his daughters a better future. This is effective because it puts the facts and figures about low adult literacy in vivid human terms that everyone could understand and try to relate to. You also wanna use examples to personalize your ideas. People are interested in people. As social psychologist, Elliot Aronson has explained, most people are more deeply influenced by one clear, vivid, personal example than by an abundance of statistical data. So when you make a speech, include examples that add that human interest to your speech. Which would you be more likely to respond? to a speech that just states there are many hungry families in our community who could benefit from food donations. Yes, it shows that there's an issue, it shows there's a problem and it's providing how uh, their life would be better or the solution of food donations. But you can really personalize it if you give that human interest of somebody who's actually lived through that or living through that. So they would, we would want to add this example. Let me tell you about Arturo. Arturo is four years old. He has big brown eyes and a mop of black hair and an empty belly. In all four years on this earth, Arturo has never once enjoyed three square meals in a single day. 
So you'll see that the reason why it would be a lot more impactful is because people are going to be reacting more to this human interest side. They can actually see or relate and say, that could be, you know, my son. I would never want him to go hungry um, or, you know, think of somebody um, that's in their family or friends. So that's why you want to use examples as well to personalize your ideas. You want to make your examples vivid and richly textured. These kind of examples supplies everyday details that help pull the listeners into your speech. So here, let's look at an example of an extended example. We talked about the brief, we talked about the hypothetical, and here we have an example of an extended example. So the general topic would be healthcare for military veterans. And this is the story or the narrative. One friend called him the funniest person I've ever known. Other friends called him a military hero. Everyone said that what happened to him was tragic. Curtis Gerhardt was a lovable guy who grew up in Iowa and went to Des Moines Lincoln High School. Eager to serve his country, he enlisted in the military right after graduation and served two tours of duty in Iraq. But when he came home to Iowa, he knew things were different. He felt guilty that fellow soldiers were losing their lives overseas. And every day he suffered from blinding, excruciating headaches. So he went to the nearby VA hospital for help. They told him he'd have to wait five to six weeks for treatment. The wait was too much. The headaches and heartaches were too much. So one Monday evening, Curtis took his own life. Tragically, he became one of the 20 American veterans who commit suicide every day. So that narrative right there, compare it to a much more dull statement, lacks any vivid and rich texture of an example. If the speaker is talking about healthcare for military veterans and basically just go straight to what the problem is and the data. One veteran experienced severe problems after returning from combat, eventually committing suicide. Doesn't have that same impact that would having that extended example that provides the details and pulls the listeners into your speech. So here are some tips on how to use examples. You wanna practice the delivery to enhance your extended examples. Like we stated, the extended example, it's a story, it's a narrative. So the impact is not only on the content, but also on the delivery. You wanna be able to practice that delivery. Without practicing it, it can fall flat because it didn't come across vivid and gripping for the listeners. So you wanna use your voice to increase impact, use your voice to get audience involved, Sometimes you have to speak fast to create that sense of action or slower to build suspense. Raise your voice in some places, lower it in other places, pause occasionally for dramatic effect. Let them kind of stop and think and process about what you're, you're saying. And most important, you want to make eye contact with your audience. That's one of those ways to really connect with them when you are providing this example. The easiest way to ruin a really good example is by just reading it straight from your notes and not making eye contact. So that's examples. Now let's talk about statistics. Statistics is numerical data. We feel a lot more secure in our knowledge when we can actually express it numerically. When we can measure what we are speaking about and express it in numbers, then that means that we know something about it. But when we cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is meager and unsatisfactory, according to 19th, 19th century physicist, Lord Kelvin. So here's an example. If you're trying to illustrate the dramatic increase in pay for professional athletes, you could use statistics, statistics to really um, show that impact, give them that number of what it means. ESPN reports that just 20 years ago, the highest paid baseball player made 5 million. Today, the highest paid player makes more than 35 million a year. So you can see how statistics, but in, comb in combination to show the magnitude or the seriousness of the issue. You want to be able to understand statistics. Statistics can lie. They can be manipulated and distorted. So you wanna make sure that when you're using them, 
you're using them ethically and wisely. So let's look at these examples. Which statement is true, A or B? The cheetah clocked at 70 miles per hour is the fastest animal in the world. Or the pronghorn antelope clocked at 61 miles per hour is the fastest animal in the world. You would normally say the cheetah, but it really depends. Although the cheetah can go faster, it can only go that fast for very short sprints. The antelope can maintain the 61 miles per hour at a much greater distance. Now let's look at this example. In 1938, the US president earned a salary of $75,000. In 2018, the US president earned a salary of $400,000. So in what year did the president receive the highest salary? Well, if we're talking about purely mathematical terms in 2018, but one measure of inflation rate is the consumer price index, which lets us gauge the value of the dollar in any given year against its purchasing power. So what that means is, what could you buy with a dollar in 1938 compared to what you can buy with a dollar in 2018? So based on that definition, um, it was actually less in 2018 than one third of the value of the salary in 1938. So that's why it's very important that when you're looking at statistics, you really understand what they mean and what those different ways are, not necess necessarily manipulating them, but it's like, well, this can be taken this way or this way. Are statistics representative? Have you stopped 10 students at random and asked them whether they favor or oppose banning recreational vehicles on public lands and six approved the ban and four did not? Would you then be able to accurately claim that 60% of the students on your campus favor banning the recreational vehicles from the public lands? Well, this is obviously a no. And these are the reasons why. Because 10 is not a big enough sample those 10 do not accurately reflect the school's proportion of male and female. It doesn't reflect the proportion of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and many other variables that are not being considered that could alter the numbers of being favoring or opposition to the ban. So in short, you wanna make sure that your statistics are representative of what they claim to measure. Are the statistics from a reliable source? Which is more reliable, the nutritional ratings of fast food offered by a consumer's union, which is a highly respected nonprofit organization, or nutritional ratings of fast food by Burger King? Well, in this case, you would know consumer's union because they do not have a vested interest in what those figures look like. So as a speaker, you have to be aware about the possible bias in the use of numbers. Because statistics can be interpreted in so many ways and put to so many uses, you should seek figures that were gathered by objective, nonpartisan sources. So here are some tips for using statistics. You wanna use them to quantify your ideas. The main value of statistics is to give your ideas numerical precision. This is especially important when you're trying to document the existence of a problem. Examples can bring the problem alive and dramatize it in personal terms, but your listeners will still wonder how many people um, are affected by this problem. So the key is in not just using examples, not just using statistics. The research has shown the impact of examples is enhanced when they're combined with statistics. Use statistics sparingly. Nothing can put the audience to sleep faster than a speech cluttered with numbers from the beginning to end. You wanna insert statistics only when they are needed and make sure that they are easy to understand. So just because um, a statistic might fit somewhere in your speech, you don't wanna use it unless it's really needed. It's really helping to support your speech. Um, so besides that, it's just gonna give more time for your audience to zone out. You want to identify the sources of your statistics. As you've seen, figures are easily, um, are easy to manipulate. So that's why it's care uh, listeners are being careful to keep an ear out for who are the sources of these statistics that the speaker is throwing out. 
You also want to explain your statistics. Statistics do not speak for themselves. Sometimes they're a little bit more complicated. They need to be interpreted and related to your listeners. Explain what the statistics mean, particularly uh, when it's um, big, large numbers that they're having to, to deal with, since these are harder to really visualize. Also, you want to round off complicated statistics. Here we have examples of uh, Mount Everest and the height, the official world land speed record, the population of Madagascar, and how far the moon is from the earth. So you'll see these are very um, large numbers. Although they are intriguing figures, they are very complicated. So what you would want to do here is just round them off. So instead of the 29,000 and 29, you would just say 29,000. And there's the examples for the other uh, numbers. You also wanna use visual aids to clarify statistical trends. So when it's a trend that you're seeing or um, it's showing for X amount of years, whether it's going up or going down or a little bit of both, um, that can be kind of hard to follow. So a visual aid would really be helpful. Let's say you are explaining the rising cost of weddings in the US and you're explaining it um, per so many years, what the cost is. These are very interesting statistics, but when it's strung together, it could be a lot to digest. So it'd be easier to understand if you included maybe some type of simple graph, maybe it's a line graph or a bar graph to show what those points are, to really visualize where they rise and fall. Now let's talk about testimony. We are often influenced by the testimony of other people. Just like you would be swayed if a friend recommended that you sign up for a certain class or if they told you actually stay away from that professor. Um, so the same way audiences tend to respect the opinions of people who have special knowledge or experience on that topic. And by quoting or paraphrasing such people, you can give your ideas even greater strength and impact. There are two types of testimonies. You have expert and then you have peer testimony. Expert testimony is testimony from people who are recognized experts in their fields. So citing the views of people who are experts in that field is a really good way to lend credibility to your speeches. It shows that you're not just stating your own opinions, but that your position is actually supported by people who are knowledgeable about that topic. Expert testimony is even more important when a topic is very, very controversial or when the audience is skeptical about a speaker's point of view. Then you have peer testimony. This is from ordinary people with firsthand experience or insight on a topic. So these are opinions for people just like you and me. We're not prominent figures, just ordinary citizens who have firsthand experience on the topic. So this kind of testimony is valuable because it gives more personal viewpoints on issues. So let's say, for example, if we are speaking on barriers faced by people with physical disabilities, you would want to include testimony from doctors and other medical authorities. But in this case, the expert testimony would be very limited because it can't communicate what it really means to have a physical disability. To communicate that, you need a statement from someone who can speak with a voice of genuine experience. So there is no way that expert testimony could express the ideas with the same authenticity and emotional impact as a peer testimony. Now let's talk about when you are using testimony, quoting versus paraphrasing. So quotations are most effective when they are brief, when they convey your meaning better than you can, and when they, when they are particularly eloquent, witty, or compelling. So if you find a quotation that fits this criteria, then you want to recite the quotation word for word. The times that paraphrasing is better than a direct quote is in these two situations, when the wording of the quotation is obscure or cumbersome, when a quotation is longer than two or three sentences. Audience, audiences often tune out partway through lengthy quotations. So then that would interrupt the flow of your ideas. So it's just one of those times that you know it's easier for your audiences to just start zoning out as well. Other tips for using testimony, 
quote and para or paraphrase accurately. So accurate quotations involve three things, making sure you do not misquote someone, making sure you do not violate the meaning of statements you paraphrase, making sure you do not quote out of context. By quoting out of context, you can twist someone's remarks so as to prove almost anything. It means you pull only certain words and leave out the rest where the meaning of the quote can take on a completely different meaning from what it was actually intended. Let's talk about using testimony from qualified sources. We all have become used to celebrity testimonials on TV and magazines, whether it's a professional basketball player who's endorsing the brand of athletic shoes or the movie star who praises a hairspray, shampoo, or some type of beauty product. But what happens when movie stars endorse a cell phone company or a tennis player endorses a line of watches? Do they know more about these products than you? Probably not. So being a celebrity or an authority in one area does not make you someone competent in other areas. Listeners will find your speeches much more credible if you use testimony from sources who are actually qualified to speak on that subject at hand. You also wanna use testimony from unbiased sources. In a speech about the use of stun guns by police officers to subdue unruly students in public schools, would it be a good idea to use testimony from the spokesperson for a taser company and explain that it is medically safe to use tasers on children? No, because of course the company who is trying to sell stun guns is going to say that they are safe. You need a testimony from a source that is not connected to or invested with any retail of the stun gun. You want to identify the people that you quote or paraphrase. The usual way to identify your source is to name the person and sketch his or her qualifications before presenting the testimony. If you do not identify the source and their qualifications, then really they are just names that really mean nothing to the audience as to why their testimony should be heeded. Also, if you use another person's words or ideas without giving them credit, once again, that it's plagiarism. This is true whether you quote them or paraphrase them. So just because you are paraphrasing a quote, you are rearranging words. You're not saying it word for word, but you're still maintaining the context of what that person said. So even though you are rearranging the words, that is not your original idea. So you have to give them credit. An example of identifying them in the speech is, let's say you're um, in the middle of a speech and then you say in their book, When Children Work, psychology professors Ellen Greenberger of the Uni University of California and Lauren Steinberg of Temple University note that intensive levels of work among youth tend to produce higher truancy and lower grades. So here you identified the names, you identified how they're qualified. They have written a book. They are psychology professors at universities. Um, and so that's telling your audience why this testimony um, is important and how they are qualified uh, to talk be, uh, about that topic. Okay, so you have your information um, you have your speech ready, but how do you cite those sources orally? You will notice a pattern of emphasizing the importance of citing your sources of your materials. Audiences are skeptics. They're listening for both the speaker's information and the sources of the information. So the bibliography in your speech outline should state the sources you use in constructing your speech. However, listeners won't have access to that outline. So you have to identify your sources orally as you're speaking. Unlike the written bibliography, where you have to set your sources a certain way or format, APA, MLA, what you need to include orally depends on your topic, your audience, and the kind of supporting material that you're using um, and the claim that you're making. But the key is basically to tell your audience enough that they will know where you got your information and why they should accept it as qualified and credible. So in most cases, you will need to identify some combination of the following, the book, magazine, newspaper, or web document that you are citing, 
the author or sponsoring organization of the document, the author's qualifications with regard to your topic, and the date on which the document was published, posted, or updated. If citing statistics, it is important to show that they are up to date <clears throat> and that they come from credible sources. You might have some exceptions. Let's look at this. Uh, if you're quoting Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address on November 19, 1963, about government of the people, by the people, for the people. You would not need to explain Lincoln's qualifications because he is so well known or the date of his statement because it doesn't affect the relevance of his words. But this will be very rare, far in between that you'll be able to do that. So just to be on the safe side, you always want to provide them these things or a combination of these things. For online sources, if you are citing a specific person, you should identify him or her and the name of the website on which you found the information. You can't get away with just saying, according to the internet, or as the internet, or per the internet, because the internet is just the huge database. It is not actually giving credit for that specific author or sponsored organization. So once again, if you are citing an organization instead of an individual, then you need to provide the name of the organization. And just like anything else, you wanna find a way to um, blend your citations into your speech. That way it doesn't cut your speech. So there's a few ways you can do that. Just kind of transitions. Uh, according to John Smith, as stated by Jane Smith, and you can modify your tone or voice or use brief pauses to let your listeners know when you are making a direct quote. You can see figure 8.2 on this next slide for examples of how you can cite different kinds of sources in your speeches. So I know it's really small on the PowerPoint, but definitely go to your book and look at figure 8.2. And that is it for chapter eight. I hope this really helped y'all to learn more as you will start uh, developing and organizing, researching um, your speech. Definitely reach out to me. Let me know if you have any questions.